Now I call upon Professor Jaden Patil to deliver his lecture. Professor Amina Kishorji and other departmental colleagues and friends. It's indeed a matter of pleasure, privilege, and pride for me to be with you today. In fact, I was eagerly looking forward to this particular day because I have a special place in my heart for this particular university. So, Ma'am, let me at the very outset say thank you to you and to your colleagues. Thank you to you and your colleagues for this wonderful opportunity uh, that you have lent me to enable me to interact with your colleagues and other younger researchers. Now, my predicament is very similar to that of uh, Mullah Nasruddin. You know, once Mullah Nasruddin was invited to talk about something, the delegation of villagers went to him and said to Mullah Nasruddin, Mullah ji, why don't you come and talk to our people in the village? And the Mullah agreed and the danger day arrived and Mullah Nasruddin stood on the platform on the dais and the very first question that he threw at the audience was, well guys, do you know what I'm going to talk about today? And the audience, all the members of the audience thought that they were very smart and then in one voice they said, no, Mullah ji, we don't know what you're going to talk about today. And the Mullah said, fantastic. I just can't think of any other opportunity like this. If you don't know what I'm going to talk about today, why did you invite me? <laughs> I'm leaving. And he left. After a week or so, the delegates of the village, you know, the delegates approached him once again and requested him to interact with the villagers. And once again, he said yes. And the, you know, the D-Day arrived and he stood on the platform and he asked the same question. Well, folks, do you know what I'm going to talk about today? And this time, the audience had decided. They thought that they were going to outsmart this mullah this time. And they said, Yes, Mullah ji, we know what you're going to talk about today. And the Mullah said, wonderful. <laughs> if you know what I'm going to talk about today, my job is done. <laughs> I'm leaving. And he left. Once again, the delegates approached the Mullah, and the Mullah agreed. Now, this time, there were they were damn sure that they were going to defeat this mullah. The mullah came, he mounted up the platform and he repeated the question, well, my dear members of the audience, do you know what I'm going to talk about today? And this time they said, mullah ji, these people know what you're going to talk about, but these people don't know what you're going to talk about. <laughs> and the mullah said, Great. Then why don't you tell them? <laughs> I'm leaving and he left. So I think my, my predicament is very similar to that of Mullah Nasruddin. However, since I have to respect my senior colleague, who is my, like my elder sister, and my other colleagues like Dr. Kadri and others, I have to say a few words on this particular topic. In fact, I did my PhD my MPhil and PhD way back in 83 and 87, respectively, on Indian writing in English, but that was a different perspective. I did a stylistic analysis of some novels of Mulkaraj Anand from my MPhil and did a, you know, did a study on politeness strategies in Indian English fiction for my doctoral degree. But that was way back in the, in the, in the 80s. After that, very honestly, let me tell you very honestly, I diversified my interests and I became an ELT and TESOL man. Though I do sometimes read Indian literature. Anyway, now, because this is a post-lunch session, I've decided, to do a, I've decided to play a couple of tricks. One, 
I want to talk in a stream of consciousness manner. <laughs> because if I make a planned and systematized and organized presentation, I'm sure you will, draw, you, you will doze off and will fall asleep. Because I want you to activate your minds, I'm going to talk in a very stream of consciousness manner like fashion so that you need to connect what I'm going to say. If I do that connecting for you, you will not be, uh, I'm sure you will not be awake, you'll fall asleep. And occasionally I'll sprinkle some humor here and there in order to keep you awake. I'm reminded of T.S. Eliot, Proof Rock. Let us go, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient is raised upon a table. Occasionally, intermittently, I was casting glances at you, and I was remembering T.S. Eliot. And I was just trying to modify those lines, and I said, I said to myself, I said to the other self that is present in me, let us speak, you and I, when the members of the audience are spread out like patients etherized upon the tables. I know it's, it's a post-lunch uh, session. Now, I would like to begin with a poem on seminar. This is what happens at many seminars and conferences. Incidentally, I've participated in national, state level, national level, international conferences, seminars, and symposia uh, in India and uh, several other countries. And this is what my experience is, you know. Unfortunately, uh, please don't misunderstand me, don't, don't misinterpret me. This conference is separate. This is different, this is unique. This poem doesn't apply to this conference. <laughs> yes, and genuinely so. There sat the learned, there sat the learned, like rows of soda water bottles. There sat the learned, like rows of soda water bottles, awaiting their turn to be drunk. And one by one, they waddled to the mic, and there unfurled their their private prejudices garbed in the robe of reason. One, a jaunty little cockroach. Maybe I'm a cockroach, I don't know. <laughs> One, a jaunty little cockroach, leapt to and fro while speaking. Another stood in solemn grandeur, like a statue carved with moving lips. A third, bearded and grim and glaring, glaring like a hawk, bore down in garrulous ferocity upon the audience. And thus it went until in God's own time their world sloshed all around the crowded hall. They mercifully left for dinner. So I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure we, you're waiting for, you're mercifully waiting for dinner. Now, uh, this afternoon, I plan to do two things, and I'm trying to be very simple because I know that there are students sitting in the gathering, and I need to be useful to them. Uh, you know, I'm going to talk about, briefly talk about the matter and the manner, the content and the code, and the subject and the style. But I'm going to focus more attention, rivet more attention on the, con on the code part on the language part, the expression part, or the style and manner part of new literatures in English. As you know, it's difficult to separate the dance from the dancer. When I watch a dance performance by an excellent dancer like Hema Malini or Yamini Krishnamurti, I say, my, I say to myself, I ask myself, can I really separate the dancer from the dance? Can I say this is Hema Malini and that is her dance? Oh, this is Yamini Krishna Murthy, and this is her dance? No. I say it's impossible to separate the dance from the dancer, to divorce the dance from the dancer. In a similar fashion, by the same, by the same token, it's difficult to separate the content from the code, the subject from the style, or uh, the matter from the manner. However, for the sake of convenience, we'll try to concentrate our attention on the code part of the new literatures in English. Now, when we look at 
Indian English for that matter. I'm not going to talk about all kinds of things. I'm going to focus my attention only on Indian English and Indian English literature, right, for that matter. So when we look at Indian variety of English or Indian writing in English, we, we can think in terms of four stages. Years ago, the first stage started and it was the stage of rejection. People used to say, Indian English is deficient, English, English, uh, Indian English is inferior, and Indian writing in English is also deficient and inferior. It's not up to the mark. Then came the second stage, which was the stage of recognition. Initially, Indian English was rejected, it was not accepted, it was not legitimized, it was not recognized, it was outright rejected as deficient, inferior, second, old, uh, second rate, faulty, defective, and so on and so forth. And a similar thing, a similar treatment was given to, omitted out to uh, Indian writing in English. Then the second stage came, and the second stage was a stage of recognition. People began to recognize uh, the existence of something called Indian variety of English, and the existence of something called Indian poetry, Indian fiction, Indian drama in English. Then came, the third stage, which was the stage of legitimization. So Indian English and Indian English literature was not only recognized, but it was also legitimized, legitimized. And finally, we have reached the stage, the final stage, the last, the fourth stage of eulogization or celebration. And um, you know, if you remember, uh, the title on the screen, uh, you know, you will see that the title is Celebrating New Literatures in English. So I want to celebrate Indian English and celebrate the existence of Indian literature in English. Now, as you know, English began to spread from England and it spread from England to Scotland, Wales, Ireland, and then North America, and Canada, South Africa, New Zealand, and Australia. Two things happened when English spread from the inner circle. You know, Kachuru talks about three circles, three concentric circles as far as English or uh, existence of English is concerned. There is the inner circle where, uh, the inner circle which consists of countries where English is used as the first language or mother tongue. And here we find countries like the United States of America, the United Kingdom, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, and a few others. Then there is the outer circle where we have countries like Nigeria, Singapore, and India. And finally, there is the expanding circle where we have countries like Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, China, etc., etc. Now, two things happened when English spread from England to the other countries uh, which belong to the inner circle and the outer circle and the expanding circle. First, the ownership of the English language came Singapore or Singaporean English, Chinese English, and so on and so forth. Right, now today we say that we have pluralized, localized, globalized, nativized, indigenized, decolonized, dehegemonized, and liberated English. Now, with the dehegemonization of English, certain things happened. For example, uh, people who started using English as a second language or as a foreign language, as a third language, started doing a few things. For example, they started transferring the, the, you know, the rhetorical patterns and the phonological patterns and the grammatical patterns and lexical patterns of their mother tongues to the other tongue. And the other tongue here is, of course, English. Sometimes the transfers, the linguistic transfers, the sociolinguistic transfers or pragmatic transfers were unintentional, unintentional. And when we say that sometimes the transfers are unconscious, unwitting, unintentional, what exactly do we mean? When we say that, we refer to what happens in a classroom in a second language or foreign language teaching situation. For example, uh, what are the important characteristics of English used by people in the classroom, our pupils, our learners, our students? For example, when you travel from Pune to Mumbai, 
or even from, let's say, Nampalli to Lingampalli, you listen to some people and they use English and they use English in a very peculiar manner, very typical fashion. Now, what are the important characteristics of English in India? We have the invariable question tag, isn't it, right? He has finished his homework, isn't it, right? So the question tag doesn't change according to the verb in the main sentence. So this is what is called invariable question tag. The other feature is an extensive use of the progressive tense, present progressive tense. I am not understanding, and we remember uh, Nisi Musical, I am not understanding why people are not following Mahatma Gandhi. I remember another poem by Nisi Musical, and that's called the, the, the Railway Clock. It isn't my fault, the clerk in the poem says, it isn't my fault, I do what I am told, but still I am blamed. It isn't my fault, I do what I am told, but still I am blamed. This year, my leave application was twice refused. This year, my leave application was twice refused. Every day, there is so much work, and I don't get overtime. Overtime means overtime money, and I don't get overtime. And my wife is always asking for more money. Money, money, where to, where to get money? Money, money, where to get money? Right? And then he continues like that. I wish I was bird. I wish I was bird. So you see that the indefinite article A is missing here, right? I wish I was bird. I am never neglecting my responsibility. I am discharging it properly. I am doing my duty. But who is appreciating? Nobody, I am telling you. Right? My desk, my desk is too small. The fan is not repaired for two months, three months. And he goes on and on. And then he says, in the last part of the poem, every, you know, once in a week I see film, no, a film. Every, you know, once in a week I see film, and then I'm happy, but not otherwise. And then I'm happy, but not otherwise. Right? So, when we listen to a poem like this, or read a poem like this, we, we realize that there are some important characteristics or features of a variety called Indian English. And some of these features are omission of the definite article and the indefinite article when it's necessary, extensive use of the ing form, like you know, who appreciates? Nobody appreciates, but he says, I am never neglecting my responsibility, I am discharging it properly, I am doing my duty, but who is appreciating? Nobody, I am telling you. All these lines are in the ING form. So omission of the definite or the indefinite article when uh, these articles are necessary is one important feature. Extensive use of the present continuous tense is another important feature. Invariable question tag, isn't it, is a third feature. Right. However, as long as we are within our country, there is no problem because there is something called intelligibility. When we talk about Varieties of English, especially Indian variety of English, we need to bear in mind the concept of intelligibility. There is something called local in intelligibility, something called national intelligibility, and something which is called international intelligibility. And you, you know, as all of us are aware, these are the times of modernization and democratization and globalization. And in such times, we need to neutralize our accent. Incidentally, I worked as senior English language advisor for three and a half years in Vietnam and other countries and worked, as, worked in the same capacity for three years in Japan. And I was face to face with two different varieties of English. In Vietnam, I taught English to diplomats. And one day, one of my students was going somewhere <coughs> It was six o'clock in the evening, and there was a girl going with him, and I asked him, Chung, where are you going? Sir, I'm going to die with my girlfriend. Would you like to join us? 
No, I'm talking about varieties of English. And I'm talking about the phonological features of varieties of English. And this is, this is Vietnamese variety of English. I wasn't aware of this variety of English at all. I didn't have an iota of knowledge as far as this variety was concerned. And in the light of when I said, Chung, I, I'm sorry I'm too young to die. And if at all I want to die, I'll go back to my country and die there. <laughs> what he wanted to say was, sir, I'm going to dine with my girlfriend. Would you like to join us? But, but in Vietnamese English, they tend to delete or drop the last consonantal sound. Right? It was 21st of September, my first day in Vietnam. It was evening time and they had organized a party to welcome me. I was a member of the Embassy of India, working as a first secretary under the ambassador, but teaching English to diplomats. And there were lots of bottles of wine lying on tables. It was a party. And one gentleman fetched me a glass of wine, white wine, rice wine. They call it Nep Mai, and said, Professor, why don't you try why why? Say, why is this man using the word why three times? Why don't you try why why? What he was trying to say was, why don't you try white wine? If my wife was with me, he would say, why doesn't your why try why why? <laughs> because WHY is of course why, wife, W-I-F-E also becomes why. W-I-N-E is why and W-H-I-T-E why. Right. So as I, you know, slowly I gradually I got used to that variety of English and then it was no, uh, I mean there was no problem understanding Vietnamese variety of English. So what I'm trying to say is that every variety has certain phonological features, certain lexical features certain grammatical features and discourse features. Now let me cite a couple of examples from our own variety as far as lexis or vocabulary is concerned. For example, we have a word like advance, or we have a word like uh, postpone. We have invented a word like prepone. Prepone is not an originally English word, though it has been added to the lexicon of the English language now. So the word that the standard variety has is advance, postpone, advance. So we have added quite a few words and the, you know, Oxford English Dictionary has a long list of those words which the English language has borrowed from Indian languages. So prepone, opticals, you know, opticals. Prepone, opticals, go down, lack, and so many other words, co-brother, so many other words have been added to the English lexicon. Right, so this is what happens in the classroom. The learner is not aware and therefore the learner unintentionally deviates, flouts or breaks certain norms of the use of vocabulary or grammar rules or phonology and so on and so forth. But when we talk about creative writing, writers do that intentionally. And some minutes ago I cited some parts of the poem, The Railway Clerk. You cannot say that Nisi Musical didn't know English. He knew English very well. Then why did he say, why did he use uh, such lines that, uh, such lines in the poem? I am never neglecting my responsibility and I am discharging it properly. I am doing my duty, but who is appreciating? He did it deliberately to give us a flavor of Indian variety of English. This is what I mean by intentional deviation, intentional uh, variation as far as the language is concerned. Right. Now, let me say a word or two. I know my time is limited. So, let me say a word or two about the pragmatics of new varieties of English. Uh, I hope you know something about pragmatics, right? Like, for example, each language and each culture has specific ways of performing certain language functions. Like, for example, in Urdu, we say, Aapka daulat khana. I never say, Mera daulat khana. If I say that, people would describe me as a very arrogant person. So, Mera jo bhi hai, wo garib khana hai. Aapka jo bhi hai, wo daulat khana hai. Right? So, 
This happens only in our language, or maybe few, a few other languages. So what I'm saying is that every culture and every language has specific ways of performing certain language functions like apologizing, complimenting, agreeing and disagreeing, complaining, and so on and so forth. And therefore, we have you know, different uh, types of examples in our novels. For example, in Inside the Haveli, Rama Mehta's Inside the Haveli, one character says, Hukum, you have been blessed with so many things, but your daughter-in-law is the greatest ornament of your Haveli. Your daughter-in-law is the greatest ornament of your Haveli. Now, this is a special, unique way of paying a compliment. You won't find a similar strategy in America. If you say to somebody, oh, your daughter-in-law daughter, daughter -in -law is an ornament, the person may feel offended. How can you compare my daughter-in-law, who is a human being, to an object? Right? But in our country, it's fine. I remember uh, one example from Chaman Nahal's Azadi. There is, a, there is an Englishman, and there is an Indian character, and the Indian character has a small boy standing by his side. And the Englishman says, is, is this your son? And the Indian character says, no, sir, he is your son only. Aap kai beta hai? In our language, it's OK. Aap kai beta hai? Aap kai beta samjhiye? But the writer transferred that, transfers that kind of strategy from the mother tongue to the other tongue. And the English gentleman is shocked. How come? <laughs> right. Right. So when we look at uh, when we look at strategies like or functions like complimenting, inviting, apologizing, we need a different kind of pragmatics. Universal pragmatics, propounded by Leach and others, will not work here. That that theory is an inadequate to describe our varieties here, or Japanese variety, for example, or Vietnamese variety, for example. Right. Now, let me just skip a few things. Now, as far as the language is concerned, let me make a couple of points very emphatically. The horizontal global spread of English and its vertical societal percolation is significantly altering its cultural composition. The language is spreading horizontally from place to place. And the language is also percolating down into the society. So the horizontal global spread of English and its vertical societal percolation is significantly altering or changing its cultural composition. The language has been acquiring new formal properties and functional roles to be able to carry the connotations of its new cultural habitats. Because cultures are different, and therefore, our writers change, modify, alter the English language to convey culture-specific ideas or concepts. And that's what Ojaide does. That's what Chinua Akibi does. That's what Rajara has done in his novels, or Mulkraj Anand has done, or Kushwan Singh has done, for that matter. So. As a result, this formal proliferation and functional diversification has been spurring scholars to challenge the traditional models and constructs which have underpinned and informed the teaching of English for several decades. Consequently, the illusion that the English language is a monolithic entity. People used to think that there is only one English, right? Consequently, the illusion that the English language is a monolithic entity is being interrogated. No, English language is not one. There are many Englishes. The framework that positions the native speaker at the center, right, and the non-native speaker on the periphery, on the borderline, is going short of subscribers today. We no longer believe that the native speaker is at the center. No, we are also at the center, as far as our variety is concerned. So the framework that positions the native speaker at the center and the non-native speaker on the periphery is going short of subscribers today. The notions that traditional varieties are donors, English, you know, British English and American English and Australian English are donors. That was the notion earlier. So uh, the notions that traditional varieties are donors of norms to the new varieties 
and that the latter, that is, the new varieties are parasites of the former, will soon be things of the past. The utility or futility of imported teaching materials is being questioned. We used to import teaching materials from abroad, but now we produce our own indigenous teaching materials because we found that those materials were not suitable for our learners or for our, to our situation. The utility or futility of imported teaching materials is being questioned. The classroom practice that required the learner to emulate, to approximate the native speaker is no longer in general use. In fact, with an increased understanding of the sociolinguistic realities and resultant orientation, reorientation of perspectives, a whole set of paradigms is going out of fashion. Right. So this is what I wanted to say about this. Now let me say, let me spend about five minutes or ten minutes on non-native literatures. Right. I am again focusing on the the code part of it. Now when we go through critical literature available on Indian variety, Indian literature, Indian fiction, drama, poetry, we find two camps. And these camps are diametrically opposite. So Indian literature in English has given rise to diametrically opposing views. For example, Bhalchandra Nemade says that Indian English literature is a temporary phenomenon. It's a rootless literature. It's nothing but parrotry and mimicry. Because the foreign medium, that is the English language, is suppressive of the talents, local talents. And he says that Indian English literature will never achieve the, uh, you know, achieve, will never go to that level of eminence or magnificence because it lacks national character and national culture. Another critic, Rajiv Patke, who is a professor of English, uh, working for Sing National University of Singapore says that English language is not the language of emotional makeup. That is what Rajara also had said. And creative work of first order is possible only in the first language, not in a, a foreign language. So there are opposite views as far as English literature is concerned. Another argument is this. Okay, we have poetry in Indian English poetry here, but can we compare Indian English poetry with poems like Stopping by Woods? Is there any poem in Indian English or is there any poem written by an Indian English poet which can compare itself with or to a poem like Stopping by Woods? For example, Robert Frost says, whose woods these are I think I know. His house is in the village though. Lovely poem. I, I haven't found a poem like this. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse, the poet is, with the, the poet is riding a horse and he stopped outside the woods, just outside the woods. And he says, my little horse must think it queer. Queer, strange, funny. Now look at the poet. The poet is peeping into the psychology of the horse. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near, between the woods and the frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He, my horse, he gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sound is the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Is there any poem written by an Indian poet which can compare itself in terms of the language, in terms of the images, in terms of the melody, the music, the rhythm? The answer most probably is no. Once I was you know, hotly debating with one of my colleagues, he said, no, Indian poetry in English is great. Then I recited another poem and I said, please find me a poem which, which is comparable to this particular poem, Daffodils. I wandered lonely as a cloud 
that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake and beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze, continuous as the stars that shine, continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay. 10,000 saw at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. What a beauty. If Wordsworth was alive today, I would go spending 50,000 rupees to the Lake District and congratulate him on such a beautiful poem. Right? And then he goes on and on in the poem. He say, I said, can you find a poem like this? And he hasn't found a poem like this yet. I'm still waiting. Uh, yes. So this is the second argument, OK? The first argument is by Nemare and Patke and some other critics. They say that you cannot write first order, first rate literature in a foreign language. It will only be a parrotry, a mimicry. It will only be a rootless, temporary phenomenon. You cannot achieve magnificence, right? And the second argument is, can you find a comparable piece? Can you find a novel which is of that caliber, of that quality, which, uh, the, you know, which Hemingway, Hemingway's The Old Man of the Sea has? No. Right. Now, but Indian writers and other writers have justified, justified their stand. For example, Akibi says, I feel that the English language will be able to carry the weight of my African experience. So my answer to the question, can an African ever learn English well enough to be able to use it effectively in creative writing? Is certainly yes, he says. If on the other hand, you ask me, can he, an African, ever use English like a native speaker? I should say, I hope not. I hope not, because the non-native speaker has to express non-native, culture-specific, culture-bound concepts, experiences, ideas, which can never ever be expressed using the native varieties, right? And that's why Raja Rao's literature, uh, Raja Rao's novels are full of expressions like seventh month ceremony. You know, pregnant woman has to uh, perform that seventh month ceremony and trade ceremony and communal meal. These ideas are Indian ideas. These are in our concepts, and they are not available in those cultures. That's why he says, uh, I should say, I hope not. It is neither necessary nor desirable for him to be able to do so. The price the world language must be prepared to pay is submission to many different kinds of use. And he goes on. Ojaidi also says something like that. The English I write and speak is neither mainstream British or American, neither main mainstream British nor American, and I cherish this uniqueness. In addition, I express the African sensibility in my writing. This sensibility is different from the Western and the Asian. A little closer to the Asian, Western universals crumble in the African worldview. African values also give different connotations to English words. English has become indigenized in Nigeria and West Africa. In any case, there is now an established West African usage of English. Let me give some examples of words and expressions that have different meanings in Nigeria and the United States. And he says, if, some, if among my people somebody eats grass, so eating grass you know, is the most important expression, if among my people somebody eats grass, it means that the person is miserably poor. But in the United States, it means drug addict. The person who eats grass is a drug addict. That person has nothing to do with drugs. Somebody could be gay in Nigeria in a positive sense of being convivial because homosexuality does not exist among my people. That's what Ojaide says, and he goes on. I skip a bits of it. And then Kamla Das says, the language I speak becomes mine, its distortions, its queerness, all mine, mine alone. It is half English, half Indian, funny perhaps, 
but it is honest. It is as human as I am human. Don't you see? It voices my joy, my longings, my hopes, and it is useful to me as cawing is to crows or roaring to the lions. It is human speech, and so on. Right. Now, the next argument is, yeah, we have already talked about pragmatics. Uh, let me give you some more examples. How do people in India invite, for example? You know, when you travel by local trains in Mumbai, you hear this kind of English. I'm not understanding, et cetera, et cetera. And how do they invite? For example, bring yourself and all the children for a meal. You must not light the oven in your own house. Now, this is a typical, you know, this is a unique, a uniquely Indian way of inviting people. Bring yourself and all the children for a meal. You must not light the oven, oven in your house. You have blessed my hovel with the good dust of your feet. You have blessed my hovel. This is from Kushwan Singh. You have blessed my uh, hovel with the good dust of your feet. Sardar Sahib, you are a big man and we are but small radishes from an unknown garden. Kis khet ki muli. Right. What is the use of repentance now that the sparrows have eaten away the field? Yeah, criticizing. We have unique ways of criticizing, inviting, uh, expressing gratitude and complaining and so on and so forth. Where does your wealth reside? Aapka daulat khana kaha hai? Sounds very awkward. This is from Kushwan Singh. Where does your wealth reside? You are sitting outside and this is your own house? Come inside. Yeah. So when we look at these functions, speech functions, which are available in Indian literature, especially Indian fiction, we realize that the, the principles of pragmatics, which are applicable, which are viable, workable in the Western cultures, cannot work in our culture. They are not adequate. So we need a different kind of pragmatics. Come, you know, maybe. Uh, variety specific pragmatics, pragmatics for Indian variety of English, pragmatics for Japanese variety of English, and so on and so forth. So that is what uh, I mean when I say we need to celebrate our own varieties, we need to celebrate our own literatures. I'm sorry, uh, probably I've taken more time. Thank you very much. <laughs>